ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم continue on in our study of kitab nikah in bulugh al maram we reach the 829th hadith the hadith of abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala narrated abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us a tashahud in case of some need which is praise is due to Allah whom we praise and from whom we ask help and forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves he whom Allah guides no one who can lead him astray and he whom he leads astray has no one to guide him i testify that there is nothing deserving of worship except allah and i testify that muhammad is his slave and messenger he then recites three verses reported by ahmed al arba at tirmidhi and al hakam graded it as good In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught his sahaba the khutbah to hajjah what is known as khutbah to hajjah and this khutbah to hajjah is known as khutbah ta uh, khutbah ta haja because it is something which is read for some great need for something that's great for example the khutbah what is most commonly known we know this in the khutbah and the reason imam al asqalani imam uh, ibn hajar Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentioned this in the Kitab and Nikah is due to the importance of the uh, of, of the marital bond and that the Khutbah to Hajja is also recited uh, during the marital bond, during the nikah. And we'll talk about the hukum as we progress through the hadith. So, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them. At tashahud. And here, Bin Uthaymeen mentions a great faida as far as when he says a tashahud in that here and we'll get to this more in the 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 benefits of this but that sometimes you find alfaz or um uh, term terms in the sharia that have names which are interchangeable and due to the importance of the tashahud and that is an important part of this khutbah to Hajjah that the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala an radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in like Ibn uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an mentioned and referred to it as a tashahud he didn't say khutbah to Hajjah what we are normally accustomed to saying the khutbah, khutbah to Hajjah but rather he said allamana rasulullahi uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a tashahud that the Prophet وسلم, taught us the tashahud for 
uh, a hajjah or for a necessity. The tashahud in case of some need. And then he recited this or he narrated this uh, supplication, this khutbah, which is, is known in Alhamdulillah, which means all praises belongs to Allah, Nahmaduhu. And this is an affirmation that we praise Him. So all the praise belongs to Allah and we praise Him, praise Him, Nahmaduhu. Uh, and we seek his assistance. When and we seek forgiveness from him. When billahi min shururi and fusina, and we seek refuge in Allah from our wicked selves, letting us know what that we contain both good and bad. Without doubt, we commit sin, as we've said countless times. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta, wa khayran khattayina tawabun. All the children of Adam make mistakes, or commit sins. And the best of those who sin, are those who repent. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, in the khutbah, he said, Man yahdi Allahu fala mudilla. He said, and whoever Allah guides, then no one can lead him astray. And whoever is led astray or misguided, then there's no guidance for him. So the hidayah is in the hands of Allah The ultimate hidayah. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. And this is from the tawfiq. For, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you receive guidance if you receive guidance to the Suratullahi al-mustaqeen this is from Allah Azza wa Jal and then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as narrated by Ibn um, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala wa ashiru an la ilaha illallah and I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship illallah except Allah except Allah so this is Tawheed is affirmed there uh, this is the Rububiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lordship of Allah likewise in this supplication in this khutbah tahajjum when we say wa ishaduan la ilaha illallah this constitutes two Two things here. Uh, affirmation or if that wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Uh wa ashadu an la ilaha. So this is a, a nafi. This is the negation of all false gods. And if we were to stop there in this khutbah al hajj in this in this when we bear the testimony of faith then that would have a meaning, a facet meaning, a wicked meaning. You wouldn't stop there. You wouldn't say, You wouldn't say that. Because there you're negating that there is a God. Period. But then, when the harf al-illa, when we say illa, this is uh, istithna, or this is the exception. Illallah. That means now you're making an affirmation. You're affirming that there is a God. There is one God. There is the only God worthy of worship. And that is Allah So that statement, just that part of the Khutbah al Hajjah contains both negation, negation of false gods, or affirmation of Allah <clears throat> and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a slave and uh, is his slave and messenger. And then he said, "Wa thalatha ayat." And then he read three ayat, and those are the ayat that we're familiar with, and we're not going to 
uh, read those ayats for the sake of time. However, in this hadith, there are immense benefits and immense fuaid we could talk about, and it would lengthen our discussion of this hadith. Uh, you, you, in fact, there are books written just about this hadith, just explaining the khutbah al hajjah So this shows us the immense benefits uh, that it, uh, because it contains so many uh, aspects of tawheed. And it is the asking for blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the praising of Allah Azza wa Jal. It contains his rububiyyah. You know, the, the, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is contained in there. Meaning that this hadith illustrates a rububiyyah. Likewise, tawheed al uluhiyah or what is known as tawheed uh, al ibadah meaning the Tawheed or the monotheism of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because in this hadith the one making the khutbah al hajjah the one saying it is seeking forgiveness from Allah is seeking refuge in Allah from their evil selves they are seeking uh, the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afru all of these things are a way of asking your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means this is Tawheed al uluhiyah or Tawheed al ibadah because this is an action that you are doing to worship Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Whereas Tawheed al rububiyyah has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself being the Lord of everything, being the creator and the sustainer of everything. So this hadith contains both of those uh, both of those aspects of Tawheed Tawheed al uluhiyah and Tawheed al rububiyah the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the uh, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because seeking forgiveness is an act of worship seeking support and assistance can be an act of worship in here it's an act of worship uh, seeking refuge can be an act of worship, especially if these uh, acts are done from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbil Alameen, seeking refuge in Allah, seeking the support and assistance from Allah, seeking forgiveness from Allah. And we're going to talk about some details very shortly, uh, some of the benefits of when at times it is not ibadah, and then as we just mentioned, when it is ibadah. So, from some of the immense benefits of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam are the following uh, benefits. As we mentioned that In the beginning of the hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu, uh, the uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he said, uh, you know, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at tashahud. So this statement, which Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala said, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us this hadith illustrates for us, or this statement illustrates the hars, hars the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, alayhi salatu wa sallam ala iblaad risala wa hidayat al ummah that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was vigilant in giving the message delivering the message and the guidance of his nation. And this fa'ida or this benefit is taken from just that statement, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us. That means the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was Haris, Haris in delivering the message. He was very vigilant and he did his full job that Allah Azza wa Jalla appointed him to do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is delivering the message of Islam so that you and I will be guided, so that mankind would be guided as is mentioned fi kitabi la wa sunnatu rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best of teachers alayhi salatu wa sallam another benefit of this hadith tasmiyat al-shay bi afdal ma jaa fihi haytha atlaqu ala hadhihi al-khutba at-tashahhud so we already mentioned this uh, another benefit of this hadith is that as a principle sometimes in the in the sharia that you find a naming of something by its best the best name that it could be named from within the context of something else let's make that clear by uh, and, and, and the example Haytha atlaku ala hadhi al-khutba at-tashahud and this is illustrated by the fact that this khutba what we know as khutbat al haja or the the uh, in English we say the uh, maybe the speech that I can't think of exactly the term we would say, but we're all familiar with khutbah. That we do the khutbah on Yomu Jumu'ah. That is for the Jumu'ah prayer. And so this is a speech or preaching uh, out of necessity. Okay, the meaning, or, or not out of necessity, but to uh, that this supplication, this khutbah, these uh, series of supplications, and, and praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is done out of uh, for some ceremony or something which shows high importance and for example that's why this is in Kitab and Nikah because of the marital uh, the importance of the marital bond and that this was a sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make this khutbah then likewise during the khutbah uh, khutbah to Jumu'ah and also along with that and that's why we did it at the beginning of this hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu and this is the way of the ulama and the salaf is that they would begin their books often or their so many of their writings and likewise their speeches with this khutbah to haja showing that what comes next has great importance. So it's bega it began or it begins with the praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiru. So it begins with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then asking him, saying that we seek, uh, you know, we seek uh, 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 your assistance. We seek your forgiveness and we seek refuge in you from our wicked selves. So it shows the importance that what comes after that is something of, of, of grave importance or something that's serious and important. The third benefit mentioned with regards to this hadith is the habab taqdeem hadhi al-khutbah bayna yaday al so this is what we've already discussed and that it shows that this is recommended to before you have something important like we said nikah marriage or uh of course the jumu'ah and some uh, perhaps in the beginning of your writings or the beginning of a speech that you give that this is highly recommended uh and also it is known, and this is also 
uh, and, and, and this is derived from within the hadith because in the Arabic, Abdullah bin Mas'ud referred to it as tashahud, we, as we recall, and he said, At-tashahuda fil haja. That this is the tashahud regarding something that is very important. Okay? With regards to the hukum or ruling here, وَقَدْ ذَهَبَ بَعْدُ الْعُلَمَاءِ إِلَى وَجُوبْ هَذِهِ الْخُطْبَةِ so some of the scholars say that this khutbah al haja or tashahud fil haja is wajib, is an obligation. But it appears, and Ibn Uthaymeen brings his, his evidences that the most sound opinion, bi'idnillah, is that it is recommended, that it is not an obligation. And one of the evidences he mentions is that someone uh, that a, a woman, she had she had offered herself to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for marriage, which is permissible. It's permissible for a woman to say, I'm interested in you and offer herself up for marriage. And of course she needs a muharam and all the other aspects of nikah, which we'll get into as we study some of the uh, conditions for nikah and so forth and so she offered herself to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet والسلام, another man had an interest a Sahabi radiallahu had interest in this woman and so the Prophet Sallallahu married her to him and in that the, he did not as Bin Uthameen said وَلَمْ يَقْرَى هَذِهُ الْخُطْبَةِ so he did not read the Khutbah al Haja in that nikah. And he said, Zawajtuka bima ma'ak mil al Quran. I have married you for what you contain from the Quran. And from that hadith, that shows us also that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not to be difficult with regards to the mahar. Not to be difficult with regards to the mahar. And we'll talk about that later when we get more into the ahadith in Kitab and Nikah. But the shahid, or the point of me mentioning that, is that the Prophet uh, Ben Uthaymeen mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Lem Yakra Hadhil Khutbah. That the Prophet Sallallahu when he married that Sahabi to that Sahabiya, that he did not read the Khutbah al Hajjah, but rather he just said, I have married you for what you contain of the Qur'an, meaning that whatever he hifted of the Qur'an, then that was her mahar. That was her mahar, maybe to teach her the Qur'an. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms that the praise is fully due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he has kamil, Sifat and alhamd is from his, is, uh, you know, it shows the, the camel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is perfect, free from perfection. And all the praise belongs to Allah. Alhamdulillah. All the praise, because when we have the alif wa lam alhamd there, that makes it uh, ma'rifah. And it, it, for us, it affirms that we're saying, for example, the praise. So that means all of the praise, it belongs to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. And He is deserving of all praise. And the ulama, they mention about alhamd, wa, uh, al-ethna, ethna ala shay. Ethna ala shay means to to praise something. For example, Athna Khalid al Rijal. That means Khalid, he praised this man. He praised this man. But Alhamd is restricted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't say Hamid Allahu ala Fulan. We don't say that. Now, as far as it being permissible or not, we have to go back to the statements of the ulama, uh, the scholars, and the salaf with regards to that hukum. But in general, the Hamd is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead you use something else, another word, for praise, for praising a person or some something. So that means that alhamd 
This is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection and that He is mustahik lahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully deserving of all that praise, tabarak wa ta'ala. He's the only one worthy of worship and He is worthy because of His perfection of all in 100% praise. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna alhamdulillah. Just as the beginning in the hadith, inna alhamdulillah. Inna is a... Is a is a a word which refers uh, we we use it for to keep to to affirm something. So here we're saying in alhamdulillah. That means verily all the praise belongs to Allah, without exception. All the praise belongs to Allah. The next benefit, the fifth benefit of this hadith, talaba ma'una wa maghfira min Allah wahdu. So here in this hadith, it also illustrates that uh, uh, another faida of this hadith or benefit of this hadith is that in this hadith contains the seeking or the asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's support and his forgiveness. So I seek or we seek uh, your assistance or your help, your support. When it's so and we seek your forgiveness. So then Ben Othaymin from his fiqh, he mentioned some fuwa'id and we'll just quickly go through it. He says, uh, so if a person says, how to Jews isti'ana bi ghayrila, is it permiss permissible to have isti'ana to seek the support of someone other than Allah? This is a very important question. And he says, Nam. He says, Yes. Yes. It's the Anabi Lady La is permissible. But of course, it's restricted. There are tafsil, there are details with this. What are the details? He says, Yes. If the person who you're seeking assistance from is able uh, to assist you. For example, if I'm in this room and I say, for example, as many of the, the people have went astray, they, they pray to the dead. They say, Oh, Abdul Qadir Ajilani, Oh, uh, Sheikh of our tribe, Oh, Sheikh of uh, such and such order, okay, Sufi order or what have you, and they pray, they supplicate to the dead. That person who they are, or they say that we, you know, we seek your assistance, that person cannot heal, hear and help them. They cannot even help themselves. They cannot cause harm, nor can they assist. So that would be shirk. That's when it comes into ibadah. But if you're seeking the assistance of someone who is able, for example, you have a family member and you say, can you please help me? I need, I need some money or I need some assistance. Someone's trying to harm me. I need this. It's something they're able to do. They're able to fulfill that. Then that's permissible. That is not shirk and that has not, no relation with ibadah. So that's what distinguishes uh, the two, and I hope that's clear. Likewise, you can ask someone to forgive you for something. If, if it relates to their haq, for example, if I took something from someone, if I back, if I have back bitten someone, and then they say, uh, and I go to them and I say, forgive me, please. I, back, I used to backbite you. And they say, I forgive you. So I sought forgiveness from them. That has no relationship with ibadah. What is ibadah is to get the forgiveness for the sins. This, these forgiveness of the sins can only be made from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushriku bi wa yaghfiru ma dhuna dhalik li ma Verily Allah does not forgive that you commit shirk, but he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases, letting us know Allah is the one who forgives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And this is related to the forgiveness with regards to sins. And this is an act of ibadah, seeking that kind of forgiveness. And so, those are some important aspects. Then, the sixth uh, benefit of this hadith, anna isti'adha tukun billah. So when we seek refuge, the, the type of refuge that is sought, that's mentioned in the hadith, when na'udhu billahi min shururi and fusina. And we seek refuge from our evil selves. 
we seek refuge from our evil selves. This is an act of Ibadah, and this comes from Eliza Wajel. Likewise, the details regarding this issue, the isti'ana, uh, so likewise, it is also permissible to have, uh, or isti'ada, it is also permissible to seek refuge in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be in a case which it is not ibadah. So this, again, the same details being that someone is able to help you. They are, they're able to give you refuge. For example, if you sought refuge in someone uh, to assist you from being beaten by someone larger than you or whatever. You sought refuge and protection from them or whatever the case may be. But letting us know that there's a difference between uh, the ibadah, the worship, when it would be shirk to do that with, when seeking refuge in someone who has no ability for you to seek refuge in. And we mentioned some examples. Seeking refuge in the dead. Seeking refuge in someone who is living even, but they are unable. They are uh, a thousand miles away. For example, if you say, my sheikh in Mauritania, my sheikh in Hadramaut in Yemen, please help me. Please, I seek refuge in you. billah. Then this would constitute shirk because he is unable to assist you you are unable to seek refuge with him he cannot support you he cannot help you he cannot give you refuge even if it's just by the phone the next benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful to us and he's more merciful to us than we are to ourselves and this is affirmed through the statement in the hadith when the audu billahi min shururi and fusina uh, and I seek refuge in Allah from the evil or we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves so here, you have sought refuge in Allah from yourself. And this is evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy and that the refuge is sought with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is that He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this illustrates that He is the most merciful and that the refuge and the support is sought with Allah wa Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us, and we, we mentioned this uh, in the beginning of the study of the hadith, that ourselves, that we ourselves, our nafs, our souls, also have an inclination towards evil. And that's illustrated when na'udhu billah min shururi and fusina. That lets us know that ourselves, we have evil. We contain both good and evil. We have the propensity to do evil and to overcome ourselves with evil. And likewise, we have the propensity to do great good and overcome the evil with good. So that's the nature of humankind, is that they have both the propensity for evil and, and good. Another benefit of this hadith is that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed to have guidance, no one can misguide him. And that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left astray because of their own evil selves, no one can guide them, no matter how much they try. And this goes back to the two types of guidance, that there is the guidance of irshad and the guidance of uh, uh, or, or, or tawfiq that the guidance of irshad is like showing someone the correct way so you can invite someone to Islam as much as you want you may love them your family members as, as those of us who have non-Muslim family members we love them and we want them all to be guided we want all of them to be saved from the hellfire so you may strive you strive you call them to Islam you invite them to Islam you show them good manners you show them the goodness of Islam but maybe Allah doesn't guide them. 
So that that issue I just mentioned that mentioned that's two types of guidance. You showing them them this is hidayah hidayah to irshad. This is showing them the way. Hidayah to tawfiq. This is the guidance of their actually being guidance, whether they are they have the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept that guidance, that their heart is changed, it's between the the fingers of Ar Rahman, it's between the, the fingers of Allah Azza wa Jal to be a, to, to have that guidance. That's from Allah uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one can guide if Allah has left them astray. And may Allah protect us from misguidance. I mean Yarabil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us and which is contained in the statement May Yahdi Allah Fala Mudillallah. So whoever Allah guides, no one can lead him astray. It shows us that the mu'min uh, is concerned about their guidance, concerned about his or her guidance, and is always asking and seeking guidance from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Another benefit of this hadith is that it is an obligation upon a person to declare what's in their heart, uh, uh, what's to declare on their lisan, on their tongue, what's in their heart. Meaning when we uh, take the shahada, it's a verbal shahada, a verbal testimony of faith. So why some of the ulama, they mention that the shahada is not valid unless it is openly declared. It's openly declared unless there's some extreme situation. Someone knows about Islam and they are fearful and they're by themselves and they, you know, even then, uh, some of the ulama, they mentioned that it should be, the testimony should be on the tongue. They, they bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And so, it shows that it's not sufficient just to say on your tongue what differs within the heart. This is the sifat of, uh, of the, um, this is the characteristic of the hypocrites, of the munafikeen. So this uh, hadith illustrates for us, because, and this is illustrated in the statement in the Khutbah al Hajjah, when he said, Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu an Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except the law, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his last slave, is his slave and messenger. So that is a verbal testimony. And of course, that is witnessed in the, in the heart as well. That should be believed in the heart. It's not just a matter of uttering this testimony of faith and then you're saved. Another benefit of this hadith is that Allah and this affirms for us the Tawheed as we mentioned Tawheed uh, Al-Uluhiyah and Tawheed Al-Rububiyah because here where you know this shows us that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who has the right to be worshipped is the only one worthy of worship. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everyone, everything worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is batil. They they have they don't have this right. This hadith also illustrates for us the affirmation of the Ubudiyya uh, Ubudiyya Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fikol he abduhu. So this hadith also illustrates that the Prophet sallallahu was a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is uh, illustrated or the evidence for this is in the hadith is when we make the testimony of faith Muhammadan abduhu is his servant or his slave so that shows the ubudiyah uh, the servanthood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam why is that uh, relevant for us because by saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the servant of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that shows that he did not share in lordship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not share, so we should not seek to come closer to Allah by supplicating to the Prophet or seeking refuge in the Prophet and all those other acts of ibadah that only go to Allah. So by saying he is the Abduhu wa Rasuluhu, that he's the slave or servant and messenger, of course you don't worship the slave. 
Of course, you don't supplicate to the slave. You supplicate to the Lord of the worlds, Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us the message of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is through the statement, as we just mentioned, the testimony of faith, faith, faith uh, Abduhu wa Rasuluhu, and his messenger. So it shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what? This is evidence that he was a messenger and he was the last messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith also illustrates for us the status of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as a final benefit of this hadith, this hadith shows us, it affirms for us one of the sifat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as well, the rahma, the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, for his, his creation. And that is illustrated because the Prophet Sallallahu was sent to it as a mercy for all of mankind. So this shows the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he sent his messenger, his la uh, a last messenger, to give us the message, to tell us how to worship him, to give us guidance in this world that has so much darkness and has so much uh, misguidance and so many various paths that you could live a life, a long life or a short life without guidance to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But, but the mu'min has the guidance. And the mu'min in our time has the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After the advent of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, we're ordered to follow his sunnah. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi. And we ask Allah the Almighty to guide us and bless us to be of those who follow his sunnah. In the 830th hadith, narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala an, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam said, when one of you proposes marriage to a woman, if he is able to look at what will induce him to marry her, he should do so. Reported by Ahmed and Abu Dawood, its narrators are Thipa or reliable, and Al-Hakam declared it to be Sahih or authentic, the aforesaid hadith has a supporting narration reported by a Tirmidhi and a Nisa'i from al mughira It also has a supporting narration reported by Ibn Majah and Ibn Hiban from the hadith of Muhammad Ibn Maslama. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, some of the benefits of this hadith and this hadith in fact is full of immense benefits because how many problems are a result from not looking at the one whom one wishes to propose to because Islam of course has a entirely different culture as far as marriage and although different societies from amongst the Muslim in, in the Muslim world that they all have aspects of their culture and differences regarding this institution the institution of nikah there are some important Islamic principles which oversee and supersede all of those uh, various cultural practices meaning those cultural practices that do not go in accordance with Islam. So, from the benefits of this hadith, this shows us the general Islamic principles with regards to when one uh, wishes to propose to a woman uh, for, in, uh, for marriage. So one of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is necessary or that it is permissible to look at the one one is proposing to. And this is because the Prophet والسلام, said in the hadith, if one of you uh, when one of you proposes to a woman 
if he is able to look at what will induce him to marry her, he should do so. So this is a strong encouragement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to look at the one that you wish to uh, get engaged to. From this, the scholars, they mention, because that leaves it open to what does that mean to look at uh, the one that you want to engage. What is included in that? Or what does that exactly mean, this look? And what are the things which restrict it? Or is it restricted at all? And so this, these types of questions arise and the scholars of Islam, the Fuqaha, they have written fairly extensively about this issue. One of the things that must be kept in mind is that when the khatib, meaning the potential bride, the one who is proposing, looks at the makhtuba, meaning the bride or I mean the uh, the bride or the the one who uh, who uh, who who the one who desires the one who one wishes to get engaged to so uh, excuse me the groom is in the the first the the khatib is the groom and the maktuba is the is the uh, bride so this hadith from this hadith the scholars they mention the scholars the fuqaha they mention that there are some that this is restricted there are some restrictions when regarding looking at the maktuba the woman who one wishes to propose to the first point that is mentioned is that there shouldn't be any khalwa. Khalwa refers to being alone. So for example, if one is going to propose and he wants to see the woman for marriage, they should not be alone. They should not be uh, segregated from others. And in fact, they should be uh, in a situation where the her mahram or her wali uh, is present, that her guardian is present in the room, or uh, you know where he can see what's going on while they are uh, while they are looking at one another and seeing one another. And this is in order to prevent uh, sinfulness from happening, happening, and also to help restrict the shahwa or the desires from being unrestrained and this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said لا يخلو لا يخلوان رجل بالامرأة ولا تسافر إلا ومعها ذو محرم the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith in uh, Bukhari that the a man should not be alone with a woman nor should she travel unless she has her guardian or has a guardian so this hadith here uh, illustrates for us the actual uh, one of the restrictions for looking at a woman meaning that you should not be alone with her and we already have an understanding of the reasons why this is the case. Another important aspect of uh, regarding the first benefit of this hadith, which is uh, looking at a woman, the permissibility of looking at the one you wish to propose to, uh, a second restriction or thing which uh, which shows the mannerisms for doing so uh, this second restriction if you will 
is that the man, the one proposing, should have the azima. He should be azimin ala khitbati wa taqaddam. That this individual should be determined, you know, that they have the actual intention of wanting to marry this woman. So it is not something, it is not a game to where you just go around looking at as many women as possible and then making a decision. But rather, this shows us the Islamic adab and manners is that the person, the man who wishes uh, to see the makhtuba, that he actually has a desire to do so. That he should actually want to have the desire to marry her so that it's not a game and he's not getting a look at something uh, and looking at her in a way which normally other men would not look at and this would be a sort of violation of perhaps her honor in, in that someone sees her in a way that she wishes not to be seen or in a way which is impermissible. So it's very important that it isn't just for the sake of looking but it, rather it's because this individual actually has a, a, a real interest in marrying the uh, the the woman, the mahtuba, and that this should be an issue related to maslaha, meaning the benefit, uh, the uh, the benefit and the encouragement of marriage, not for the benefit of fulfilling one's desires or harming or the mafsada or harm of uh, looking at the woman and taking away from her honor or belittling her. The third restriction regarding looking at the woman is that there should be a very strong chance or in the mind of the person who is going to look at her who wishes to get engaged for her, that there should be an overwhelming possibility that uh, she will accept this. And Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, rahmatullah he mentions a couple of benefits with regards to this uh, and a couple of examples. And he says, for example, and this is the case here in Saudi Arabia and in many Muslim countries, because many of the Muslim countries are traditional societies, if we could probably say all of them, all the Muslim countries uh, pretty much are strongly traditional societies. And with that being the case, they have some very strong traditions that go back centuries, perhaps even thousands of years. So one of the things is because these are often tend to be tribal societies, and in the tribal traditions, a lot of times people don't marry outside of their tribe. They're very restricted to tribe. And we know this is the case here in Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in the UAE, in the Khalij in general, in Yemen, in many different places, you have the uh, tribal systems in place in which people don't marry outside of their very tribe. Now, we're not saying that this is a good thing. But what we are saying is because this is the situation in many of those cultures, in Pakistan, in uh, India, or definitely Pakistan, and uh, Afghanistan, that these are very tribal societies. That doesn't mean all the people and all the tribes abide by this, but we have to be aware of this. So since this is the case, if a man approaches a woman that comes from a very strong tribal background, meaning that their tribe does not accept people, and this is mostly the case, then it would be a waste of time for him to see her, and in fact would maybe possibly take from her honor to sit with her and see her, knowing that the tribe will never accept this marriage. So this is why it is very important to be conscious, and that's why uh, some of the fuqaha have mentioned that there should be an overwhelming possibility that she will accept it and that the family will accept this proposal because if they reject it and then the man has actually had a sit down then he has seen her not only is it a waste of time there's no benefit in that and that this possibly 
uh, will affect her, uh, uh, you know, affect her in a negative way. Likewise, this uh, another example that Sheikh Ben Othaymin gave is that uh, in the situation where there's a difference in status, for example, uh, being in a society where you have royal families, so to speak, that they are uh, families that have uh, kings and queens, or you know, and princes, princesses and princes, and if someone was not from that status and that background they attempt to marry from them knowing that the chances are very 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 slim that they will be able to do so then this is a waste of time and there's no benefit in that so meaning that there should be an overwhelming possibility that the woman and the family will accept uh, that the person accept the person who is go who is uh, who wishes to get engaged with the uh, and propose in marriage to the woman another benefit of this hadith is that also this this hadith shows us that it encourages to look at the woman but this does not mean that there should be excessive uh, looking and what is meant by this is that you know there there are boundaries and that a person should not be uh, looking just to receive enjoyment just to receive to uh, encourage their desires but rather this has a very important purpose and this should help to encourage you to marry her and with that that uh, the scholars mention that the looking at the woman should be in accordance with the hajjah, with the necessity to see. Meaning that if you uh, a man needs to see her general shape, then uh, and he's already seen her face in the sit down, but he wishes for her to stand up, then oh, this is permissible for her to stand up and maybe turn around so he can see her shape and what will entice him to marry her but however for her to just uh, and it's important for us to mention that because there are some shad opinions of some of the fuqaha like Imam Ibn Hazm and others who say that the, the from this hadith they deduce that the man should see whatever that there is no restrictions because they are the dhahiriya their fiqh is looking just at the apparent meaning of the text without taking in consideration the reasons uh, and the understanding of the hadith but rather they're looking at a very literal meaning of the hadith so for them the idea which is not accepted by most of the scholars and most of the fuqaha is that it's permissible for a man to see a woman even without her clothing and this is not uh, this is not permissible this is a mistaken understanding but it's important for us to have an, to to understand where these opinions come from so going back to the fourth uh, point regarding this hadith is that the man is, is should be looking at her in order to with within uh, within reason and this also goes back to the particular culture as well there are some cultural norms which differ from society to society so the culture is something that the Sharia recognizes and is important another benefit uh, which uh, Sheikh Ben Othaymin mentions with regards to the another and looking at the woman is that he says that it is not permissible for a woman to uh, beautify herself to put on makeup and beautify herself in this sitting and we know that this happens in many many cultures he says because one of the uh, mafsadas one of the the negative things that result from this is that often there uh, a man and I know a real situation similar to this recently there was a marital problem where a man married a woman and she made herself she beautified herself in the city makeup and all of these things and then 
he became very dissatisfied very early on in the marriage because what she she beautified herself to such an extent it was deceptive and so this we see that this is a big problem and this actually happens to a lot of individuals uh, who are uh, trying to who, who, who get married is that there's a type of deception uh, by excessively beautifying herself and putting on makeup another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the wisdom behind looking at the woman in this particular situation and that the Sharia encourages uh, happiness and encourages those things which will be pleasing to a person and that it cuts off those things which be will be displeasing so for example if an individual does not look at the woman and says no I'm just I know she's good in her religion I'm gonna rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that often over time that this can be tested with that individual maybe for some individuals this is sufficient but for many people this is not the case and especially in the types of societies and what we've been exposed to in this time that it's very important that a man gets a look and that the woman sees her suitor that she sees uh, him as well that it's not just a one way because perhaps the woman will not be pleased and women are also uh, they have desires and they also have these choices and a woman needs to be pleased with her husband as well so it's very important this another and it shows that the Sharia encourages uh, this happiness and encourages going into these situations based on knowledge and the way that you have knowledge about your spouse one of the ways is to see them is by seeing them is having a knowledge you know and this is increases your knowledge to make a decision about the marriage and this also is from Basira is from uh, wisdom and insight uh, a last benefit of this hadith is it shows us that it is impermissible outside of the situation to look at a woman because the Prophet وسلم, said either khataba ahadakum al-imra'a that you know that they sh showing us that this is a shart that this is a condition it's conditional to look at a woman letting us know that normally it's not permissible so those are just some of the benefits of this hadith and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil